I think with this particular group uh, or, or this, the people in this training, it seems like the idea of cleaning up is relatively, we have an orientation to it. We have some sense of what it points to. Um, but I still wanted to ask, I was in there asking myself, what is cleaning up? How would, how would I define that? And so uh, I'm going to attempt at that, but there's some caveats here. Uh, the first interesting shift we can make here, um, given that we are doing the four facets, we started with waking up and now we're in cleaning up, right? In waking up, for me, we are going beyond the content of our experience. So for example, in waking up, we're not so much concerned with what we're thinking or what we're feeling. We're concerned with the nature of thoughts, the nature of feelings. But in cleaning up, we're very interested in what we're thinking. We're very interested in what we're feeling. And we're working with this, these experiences on their own terms. So this is one shift we're making from waking up to cleaning up. In terms of how waking up supports cleaning up, for me, it's a sense of providing room and space and even safety, a sense of wholeness and safety. When, when we cultivate that in a certain way, for example, in the body practice we've been doing, we've been cultivating a sense of okayness in the body, even if it's a little bit. So that's how that can support cleaning up. Now, in terms of what is cleaning up, it, it, there are so many different phrases and words that are used to refer to this work. Cleaning up, healing, therapeutic work, shadow work, uh, working with emotional, relational wounds, trauma work, the list goes on. And uh, I'm acknowledging that because anything I say, I don't want that to seem like I'm uh, suggesting that cleaning up is reduced to anything I'm saying. But more of this is like a, a talk to invite us into this space and get drop into our experience a little bit more. Um, yeah, and there are different theories, different approaches, different techniques. Some of them do the similar things, and some of them are very different in how and how and what we're working with in the cleaning up practice. Um, so if you go if you work with a psychologist or a psychotherapist, they may have very, very different approaches. And in the first group, someone brought up that uh, there's this well-known research that suggested that who we're working with, whether an individual or in a group, is more important, is the most important factor than the approach or technique. I tend to find that's very true. It doesn't mean that the approach and technique is irrelevant, but the power of relationship, the power of presence with each other is uh, incredibly important. The sense of support, the sense of safety in order to go into vulnerable cleaning up work. That's really important. And how would, for me, if, if I try to summarize what is cleaning up, um, to paraphrase Judith Blackstone, it's uh, we're healing to wholeness. It's a simple way of saying it. Again, different approaches would say something different. Um, but I like that. And it's differentiated looking ahead to the next week when we'll be working with growing up. Growing up has a sense of expanding, including more. There's a sense of growing and complexity. But with this healing, we are reclaiming uh, qualities that are our birthright to be here and to be present as humans. So we have the ability to know. But we can constrict this ability to know in response to life, in this response to overwhelm and confusion and intense experiences. So if we've done that, where we've lost touch with our ability to know, we reclaim that ability to know through the process of healing. That's just one example. So what are we working with in the practice of cleaning up? That's another question. Again, to put it simply for me, we're working with patterns of behavior, thought, reaction in our daily life, whether that's relationships, work, society, what, whatever it might be. And these patterns, we find them for ourselves difficult to say, uh, put it simply, and that they're at least partly unconscious. They're partly unknown to us. We might have a sense of them, but we don't fully understand this experience in ourselves and we want to bring it to the light and to work with it. 
another uh, key point about cleaning up is a lot of times it's about working with the past that is still playing out in the present. So we might have had a, had a single experience in the past or repeated habitual experience that was uh, difficult, overwhelming, or traumatic. And that experience is, and how we adapted and responded to it and coped with it is still present. And it, and it needs our attention. It wants our attention. And also, it's important to note that we, when we talked about the quadrants last week, for example, in integral theory, that these we're talking right now a lot from the perspective of us as individuals, even though these traumatic experiences are often are usually arising in relational experiences, in societal experiences. So when we look at the quadrants, we can see that these are all connected to cleaning up as well. So there may be something happening in the biology of our system that is making things harder or that we can find support in the in practice of cleaning up. There are systemic issues that make, <laughs> that lead the trauma or exacerbate the problem or make it difficult to heal, so on and so forth. So cleaning up can be very multidimensional, even though we're sort of really honing in on a sort of upper left interior experience of cleaning up. So next question, how does uh, motivation arise for cleaning up? For me, two simple ways. Self-love and compassion is one, where we start becoming aware of difficult experiences and out of love for ourselves, we find some courage to say, I wanna work with this. It's gonna be hard, but I wanna work with this. I want to have a different experience of life. I wanna feel more present, safer, more engaged, et cetera. The other one is responsibility where we get messages from the relationships we're in, the world we're a part of, that how, we're, how we are relating to others in the world is causing difficulty, causing harm, and we receive that message, especially from people we love or who, and we feel loved by and who we trust. We, we take that in and we say, okay, I wanna work with this. I wanna go in and see what's here to discover and to clean up. Now, how do these painful experiences emerge? We've already kind of hit upon that a little bit. Um, to restate something that I think is really important is that there's a lot of wisdom in how these painful patterns emerge, and especially if we imagine um, our experiences as children. If we're in the face of something incredibly overwhelming, incredibly painful, confusing, we are going to somehow try to adapt so that we, we can survive that experience. And some of the ways that we do that is to fragment ourselves, to cut ourselves off from qualities like love and trust or um, from knowing from our own power. And so they arise with some wisdom, but then over time, uh, as we grow, we find that those strategies and patterns are no longer serving us. And we'd like to figure out a different way to respond. And we likely have better conditions, hopefully, that allow us to, to work with these um, difficult patterns from the past. A few ways that we can kind of categorize how these patterns arise, uh, borrowing from Judith Blackson again, um, she lists out protection, mirroring, uh, nurture, compliance, and compensation. So protection I've already uh, alluded to a little bit that we just, we feel unsafe and we adapt in that moment. We figure out an immediate strategy, whether we know it or not, to adapt with that, which leaves a ram, uh, ramifications in our experience that turn into shadow elements. Mirroring would be taking on patterns of for example, caregivers in our life. So if a, if a caregiver that we have that's really important to us uh, as children, we witness them prioritizing knowing and deprioritizing love, emotions, we may very well mirror that because that's how we're learning to be in the world. We mirror our caregivers and people in our lives. And then later in life, we discover this pattern and a phrase that can come up is, this isn't mine. 
it, it is mine, but it's not mine. And we work with untangling that experience that we had. With nurture, similar to that, in that example I just gave, there could be an experience of not having a certain part of us nurtured. Maybe our knowing wasn't nurtured. You know, maybe that wasn't watered. And so it kind of withered, you know, and it didn't grow into its, um, its fullest expression. Compliance is you know, what it sounds like. We, we constrict parts of ourselves, adapt because we're trying to keep the peace, trying to keep a sort of equilibrium in whatever situation we're in. And then compensation can happen almost in response to other uh, difficult patterns we have. So for example, if at one point in time we were overpowered in a certain way, our power was violated and we lost the sense of feeling empowered. Well, into adulthood, maybe we don't have that, but we realize and feel, well, I need to have some presence of power in the world, like at work. I need to have some way to assert myself. And we might adapt compensating strategies. So for example, to, I might have my chest puff up and I may lean forward. Maybe I adopt an aggressive stance. And this gives me some semblance of power, um, but it's not the same thing as resting in our own empowerment. And we notice that, and so we try to work with that pattern. Other examples of how we do some of these things, like um, we may have suppressed our ability to cry, or the opposite, if crying got our need, we may find we cry a lot because that was the strategy that helped get something that we weren't getting. So this is why we have to be very curious because any particular pattern we have, we don't know. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it was a coping strategy, maybe it's not, but that's part of the being curious. So how do we clean up? Again, so many different options. Um, this is usually done not in an isolated way. You know, with waking up, that can happen a lot where it's like, oh, I'm going to wake up on my cushion by myself. But usually cleaning up, we are working with somebody, a person, a therapist, some healer, or we're doing it in group. We're doing it with others in our lives, partners and family and friends and um, communities. So there's usually some sort of relational element to it. Something that's really important is safety. As I mentioned, we have to feel safe enough to go into these vulnerable experiences and in particular when that often means reliving vulnerable experiences that we wisely coped with in the past um, to bring them out again. And um, again, I emphasize curiosity, patience, and compassion with any of this. 